Thank you so much, Shannon. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome to our 2024 <clears throat> NOAA Fisheries EBM EBFM seminar series. Uh, today we continue the series that's been running for some time since uh, November 2017. And we're, uh, our main focus is to increase awareness about ecosystem-based fisheries management and highlight the progress that NOAA and our partners are making with respect to enhancing EBM strategies. I want to take a moment to really thank Shannon. She's been a wonderful uh, partner in this effort, and she will be moving on to uh, greener pastures after this presentation. So I really want to extend my uh, appreciation and thanks to Shannon for all her efforts. Uh, the NOAA Library staff continues to be a valuable partner in this endeavor, and um, our se seminars are every uh, second Wednesday of the month from 3 to 4 Eastern Time. Each presentation is publicly accessible and recorded and archived. So you can see that uh, uh, in the chat. You'll probably see a, a link to our past recordings. Uh, following today's uh, presentation from Cody, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our speakers. And um, also, uh, there'll be an opportunity to follow up more directly. If you'd like, Cody will provide uh, contact information. So. Uh, many thanks to all our speakers, the colleagues and attendees and folks that recommend many of the speakers that we have for this uh, uh, year, this season. Um, I also want to draw, draw attention that we do have a speaker for um, next month that will be on May 8th. And that is one of our colleagues at NOAA Fisheries, Yvonne uh, de Renier, who is from our West Coast Regional Office and will be uh, providing us an update on NOAA Fisheries uh, revised EBFM policy and the roadmap that the agency will be undertaking to advance EBM and EBFM in the future. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Cody Swalski, who is from our Alaska Fisheries Science Center, and he will be talking about the collapse of the eastern Bering Sea snow crab, the drivers, the management response, and the rising challenges. So Cody, many thanks for your efforts and joining us today, and I appreciate you taking the time. I'll turn this right over to you. All right. Well, thank you for having me, Peg, and thanks to everybody at the library as well. This is a great opportunity to be able to talk about some topics near and dear to my heart. Um, so it'll be focused mainly around crab in Alaska. Um, first, a little bit of my background is I, I am at the Alaska Fishery Science Center where I'm a research biologist. Um, I sit on the crab plan team, which is the a uh, first level of peer review for science that goes into the management process. I also write stock assessments for snow crab and a red king crab stock in the Bering Sea. And I am a part of the Alaska Climate Link Modeling Project, which is a, a group of scientists that um, from many different backgrounds, from economists to ecologists to climatologists, that are trying to understand um, what the future might look like for the Bering Sea ecosystem and how management might respond to it. So um, today I'm hoping to break the talk into three big categories. I'd, I'd like to introduce you first to Bering Sea crab fisheries and orient you there a bit. Um, then move to the collapse of snow crab. Uh, snow crab is one of the, the largest fisheries for crab in the Bering Sea. Um, and then talk a little bit about uh, how our fisheries management system is responding to the changing environment. All right, so here's Alaska in the green. The Bering Sea Shelf is here in the light blue. We've got five species of crab uh, and 10 stocks. We have one big stock of snow crab, one big stock for tanner crab, two stocks of blue king crab, two stocks of golden king crab, and four of red king crab. And this Bristol Bay um, fishery here is the, the big one for red king crab. Uh, these fisheries are, are really iconic in, in the culture of Alaska. I mean, they're known there and beyond. Uh, I imagine a good chunk of you have heard of Deadliest Catch, which is a show that's been on for 20 years chronicling these, these fisheries. And two to five million people watch this show weekly. So it's really a, um, a I guess, a, a cultural iconic fishery in the area. And I'm gonna throw up just a couple of, of videos here to show you what it looks like to fish crab in the Bering Sea. The conditions are rough and it is the deadliest catch for a reason. Um, 
historically, one of the biggest things that has happened in the last few decades in the crab fisheries is the rationalization of the fisheries. And that's the movement from uh, a derby race to fish type of scenario where they went out in all sorts of weather because they had to race to get the crab to one that's based on quota systems. So they can go and fish whenever they want to catch their quota. Um, this has actually made the, the fishery much safer and more efficient. Um, and what you're seeing here is how they actually catch the crab. They've got big pots, they drop them on the seafloor, they soak them for a while, pull them up and put the crab live into their hold. Um, so in addition to being a, a, a cultural phenomenon, it's also an important economic um, driver in, in the area. These are the time series of catch of the different crab species that we have in the area. And the big ones that'll pop out here are the purple, which are snow crab, the pink, which is tanner crab, and then the, the green, uh, which is Bristol Bay Red King crab. Um, when you put this in the context of just the volume of um, seafood that comes out of the Bering Sea, crab is relatively small. Um, so it's this orange line here, just above walleye pollock, which is this um, lighter blue color that is your filet of fish, fish sandwich and at McDonald's, uh, and Pacific cod and salmon in the uh, pink color and purple colors, respectively. But when you look at the value, the ex-vessel revenue value of those different groups of species, crab becomes a much larger contributor to the, the overall picture. Um, so given the, the cultural significance, the economic importance, and the ecological importance, this is a, a fishery that we spend a lot of time and effort managing. And one of my, my favorite uh, quotes by Dr. Spinrad, our Undersecretary of Oceans and Atmosphere, is that NOAA is the nation's environmental intelligence agency. And I think this probably makes me as a fish biologist feel a little cooler than I have any right to, to feel. Um, but when you think about the similarities of um, the sorts of things that we do, perhaps there, there is some link to be made. Uh, on a yearly basis, we, we collect data that have varying degrees of uh, uncertainty associated with them. And then we bring them together and try to synthesize those data sets to build a coherent explanation of natural phenomena. And then we use that explanation to try to make some time sensitive decisions that impact the lives of people around the nation, like how much it's okay to catch of snow crab in any given year. Um, so just for, in that spirit, I want to talk a little bit about our yearly management cycle and how how this actually unfolds. Um, it starts with the Eastern Bering Sea Summer Scientific Survey that's been going on in its present form since the 70s, in almost its present form since the 70s. And this is really the cornerstone of our management process. It's likely the most important thing that our science center does, in my opinion. If we don't have the data, there's not much to say. Um, this figure on the left shows the, the data for snow crab in 2021, where each of these squares is a trawl, um, and then the color represents the density. Uh, there are also trawl stations in the inshore here, but we don't find any snow crab there. It runs from June to August. Um, we go out, we speciate the catch, we count it, weigh it, check the maturity. There are interesting special projects going on every year. And again, it's just really the, the keystone of our management process. And I got to go out last year, so I'm gonna share some pictures. I feel like that's a oblig obligatory thing to do. Uh, this is the vessel I was on. This is what the deck looked like. This is a trawl coming up out of the Bering Sea. Uh, there are two ladders placed on the deck here and they're dropping the catch in between the space there. Uh, we will jump in shortly and start sorting that and weighing it and um, sexing it. And some of those catches look something like this when you get up close to them. These are particularly crab heavy. Sometimes it's just all pollock, but you can see the little snow crab in here on the left and the big red king crab over here. Once we pull out the crab, uh, we line them up. We take a subsample of them. We line them up. We measure them. We check um, for disease. We check if, and these down here at the bottom are, are diseased critter. 
Um, the air conditioning just kicked on, so I hope that you guys can still hear okay. If not, it'll be off shortly, and between now and then, just pretend like you're on the beach uh, learning and looking at crab. Um, so we spend time measuring them, weighing them, and th these are the data that go into our assessments. Uh, we also pull the stomachs out of predators like this Pacific cod on the left so we can know what's eating what. And uh, last year we put satellite tags on some big red king crab and re-released them so we can see where they go when the survey is not around. Once the survey happens, um, we, the stock assessment scientists get those data and they put them into their assessments and then they're presented to the crab plan team in September. Um, we select a model that will set the overfishing level, and then that is passed on to the science and statistical committee, which then does another review of the science to make sure that it's all based on the best available science. Um, and from there, the state takes over and sets quotas. Uh, the crab fisheries begin in the late fall, early winter. We have another meeting in January to talk about all of the things that we wish we knew but we don't know or ways that we can improve the models and then we try to present some of those improvements in may and ultimately the cycle starts all over again in july um, so given this is a an ebfm seminar i thought i might talk about some of the um, special aspects of crab fisheries uh, in alaska with respect to ebfm and this is thanks in large part to gordon cruz who uh, put together a manuscript recently looking at just this thing um, that he invited me to be a co-author on. And one of the big things, um, perhaps the biggest, is the inclusion of a sloped harvest control rule here. So uh, this figure on the right, the y-axis is essentially the harvest rate and the x-axis is the amount of biomass in the water. And this line dictates how hard we harvest the stock given its biomass. And the important thing here is this kink beneath a certain point, uh, we ratchet down the harvest rates. Um, this is a good check for things like the recent collapse of snow crab. But we also have uh, pay attention to things like fishery and bycatch interactions. Um, so we have uh, an area where there's a bycatch limitation zone for snow crab. And if there is a um, if the bycatch in other fisheries, aside from crab fisheries, exceeds a certain level, there are management measures that kick into place in this area. Um, we also have spatial closures that are closed to certain types of deer, of, of gear, like troll gear, um, the Pribilof Islands Habitat Conservation Area and the Bristol Bay Closure Area being two of those. Um, but I think one of the big things that came from the paper is that in spite of these uh, numerous, and this, this is a, an incomplete list of the sorts of EBFM measures that are implemented, um, in spite of these numerous measures, we have three of 10 stocks that are now overfished for our crab fisheries. Um, snow crab fishery, so these lines over here are the status of the stock in terms of biomass over time. Um, the, the dashed black line is the um, target biomass, and then beneath this dashed red line, the stock is declared overfished. So blue king crab in this upper left panel, uh, both of those stocks are overfished, and so is snow crab down here. And our Bristol Bay red king crab is uh, dangerously close to that line. So. Um, that really shifts me into thinking about uh, the next portion of the talk, and that's talking through the collapse of Eastern Bering Sea snow crab. Um, and it, I'm gonna take off my, my secret agent cap and put on my detective cap, because um, I'm trying to collect clues about what happened that I didn't directly observe, and it gives me a chance to revisit one of my favorite books from grad school, The, the Ecological Detective, and put up a, a goofy picture of me with pipe in the mouth. Um, but the, the backdrop of the story is that in, so on the left here is a time series of abundance of snow crab in the Eastern Bering Sea from our trawl surveys. And in 2018, there were more snow crab than we had ever seen in the Bering Sea 
ever in this time series. And in 2021, there were fewer. Um, snow crab, as you may have guessed from their name, uh, like the cold. So they're generally associated with the cold pool, which is a mass of cold water on the seafloor that is left behind after the ice melts um, each year. And this dark blue line here is the ice extent, um, which was conspicuously low in 2018 and 2019, which is the period over which the uh, collapse began. And the resulting cold pools were, in 2018, there was barely a cold pool at all. We'd never seen such a small cold pool. In 2019, it wasn't much better. So the management response to this collapse was declaring the, the fishery overfished. And I should note that um, overfished just refers to um, the biomass declining beneath a certain biomass target or biomass threshold, really. Um, it wasn't a, a, fishing was not the driver of this collapse, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, the fishery was closed in 2022 and we have a rebuilding plan underway. And to just try and, um, I guess, describe the enormity of the situation to the communities that are dependent upon these resources, uh, this was, almost a quarter of a billion dollars in ex-vessel revenue in 2020, and that went to zero in 2022. Uh, so it's it's a, a fishery disaster. It was This is impacting the lives of many people and communities um, along the West Coast and in Alaska. And this wasn't just a uh, an Alaska-focused event. People around the world were taking note. Um, this was on the front page of CNN one day, which was a surprise to me. And I got calls from or texts from Japan and the Netherlands and Canada saying that they were seeing this on their news. So this was something that uh, really sparked something in the, the broader public. And the questions that were swirling around um, were, were these. We had three big ones. What happened? What's going to happen next? And what should we do? Uh, and I'm going to try to step through each of those as we talk through the presentation here. I'm going to give you just a little more context on the fishery because I think it can be useful. This again is that picture of the, the footprint of the snow crab population in 2021 as seen by the survey. And the, the fishery happens down here in deeper waters on the large males. Um, generally, the, the dynamics of the stock are such that the larvae are advected uh, farther north, and then there's an ontogenetic migration south and west as they grow older. Um, snow crab also have a terminal molt, which means that they, they will shed their shell one last time before becoming mature and then never molting again. And the size to which uh, the females and males do that too is different. Um, so the males are much larger. This big one on top is a male and the one on the bottom is a female. Um, and when that female molts to maturity, the male will come pick her up and guard her while her shell is um, soft and then they'll mate and go their separate ways. Um, the fishery is also only males um, because of the, the big legs that they have. And, um, the next, the next question, or I guess the first question really, is what happened? And um, being a modeler, the, the first tool that I turned to was a population dynamics model or a stock assessment. And uh, for those of you that don't do stock assessment, the, the basic idea is, is very simple. We try to understand the, the biomass or the abundance of a population next year, T plus one, based on the biomass or abundance that we see this year, plus some additions in that year and minus the removals. So the additions could be things like births or immigration or somatic growth in the case of biomass. And the removals are things like natural deaths, um, which we group predation, disease, cannibalism, all of those things into that. Um, fishing deaths or immigration. And some of the outputs that you'll see of stock assessments are things that look like this on the right. And so this blue line is the estimate from our stock assessment of the abundance of immature animals based on the data, which are the, the black points with the um, bars representing the uncertainty in that data. And then these are the sizes down at the bottom of the immature crab and the mature crab on the right. So in um, 
reality, these comp these models are much more complicated. That was those are the equations that uh, go into the one of the assessments for snow crab that I have, and. Uh, because some people are more or less interested in those, while I speak about the model structure, I'm going to put up this video of spider crab in um, the in Australia somewhere. Uh, these, these aren't snow crab, but it's difficult to get video of like this of snow crab given the environment in which they stay. Um, but they're closely related, and it gives you an idea of how they move and also how they molt, which is a key thing that. Um, we have to think about in doing stock assessments for crab that they don't in fish. So fish have a continuous growth. Um, crustaceans have a discrete growth. Uh, they molt once and they, in the year for snow crab and then they grow to a, a certain size, but a fish puts on weight over the, the course of the year. So the assessments that we use are size structured instead of age based. Uh, we track the numbers of uh, crab at a given size in a given year through the years. Um, and to do that, uh, we have to have a, an idea of how much they grow in a year or how much they grow when they molt. Um, and that piece of machinery in our stock assessment is called a size transition matrix, and it is informed by data that um, partners have gone out and collected where they go into the ocean, they trawl in, or they trawl in an area where they've got crab that they think are going to molt, they pick up the ones that are about to molt, measure them, put them somewhere safe, and then measure them again so we've got a pre and post molt growth increment. Okay, now, now the interesting stuff happens, and even if you're interested in the models, you probably won't uh, be paying attention after this. This is the, the molting process um, of spider crab here. They, they literally just back out of their shell. Um, yeah, it's, it's otherworldly. I'm just going to watch too, because it's uh, quite the experience. Yeah, so that's, um, these are the sorts of things that we have to space, pay special attention to when we are modeling the dynamics of crab in the Bering Sea and elsewhere. Um, so one of the things that we got out of these population dynamics models was an estimate of how that natural portion of mortality that wasn't fishing uh, varied over time. And that's this red line here. Um, this is for immature crab on the top and for mature crab on the bottom. And I think the thing that you'll probably immediately be drawn to is this spike in 2018 or 2019 of mortality that's much higher than any of the other years. Um, so our goal here was try to understand that spike. And to do that, we looked at the historical time series and all of the hypotheses that we could think about for why the um, crab may have died. Here I'm going to note that uh, we did think about maybe they moved, maybe they died. I'm not going to talk about how we came to the conclusion that mortality was likely a large driver of this, but you can go read the paper if you like and send me questions if you've got them. Um, so there were a lot of hypotheses for why the crab may have died at that point in time. I, it could have been that the water was too hot and they just cooked in their shell. There could have been disease or discards in the directed fishery. They could have eaten each other. There could have been other fisheries that were impacting the stock somehow. It could have been a function of density or predation. Um, there, there are a lot of different ideas floating around. And we built indices that represent each of these hypotheses. And um, through our analyses, temperature and mature population were the consistently significant covariates coming out of the model. So temperature and mature population had something to do with it. But just at first blush, um, the, the temperatures weren't, weren't so high that the crab could not survive. We know that from the laboratory that they can survive the temperatures they were at. And it's also a little bit trickier to understand how an increased density could result in mortality. And the key piece of information actually came from the 1980s. Um, the, the figure you're looking at is from Foyle et al. Um, they went and collected a bunch of snow crab from the wild, put them in different baths of different temperature. That sounds a little bit more luxurious than it probably actually was. But they had these different baths at different temperatures, um, and they tracked a bunch of things. 
Uh, one of them, and the, the key piece of information for our analysis was the, the caloric requirements. Um, so from zero degrees here on the x-axis to three degrees, uh, there was roughly a doubling of the required um, calories for the crab. So if we take that piece of information and then we look at the temperature of the of the, the crab were occupying when we captured them in the survey, and this is something else that we get from the survey, our, our measurements of bottom temperature. And then we look at the, the number of crab out there. We can calculate the, the needed caloric requirements, and that's here in the left. So the colors just represent the different sizes of crabs needing food, um, but the absolute height of it represents the population level needs. And from 2017 to uh, 2018, there is approximately a quadrupling of the requirements, and that was double the previous high back in the 90s. We look for other pieces of this puzzle to try and uh, sort out what might be going on. And looking at the weight and size of the crab um, that we've collected over time was another interesting avenue to pursue. And uh, the upshot of this analysis with, was that the weight at size of a 75 millimeter carapace with crab was 15% less in 2018 than 2017. So it seems like they were a bit lighter in their shell. Um, the, the population was also concentrated in the smallest footprint that it has been since um, we've been watching the stock. So down here in the left hand corner, the, the colored uh, dots are the colored squares are places where snow crab were observed in 2018 and then the grayed out squares are places where we have historically seen snow crab. I should give you a little sneak peek here. Uh, the Kodiak lab um, with Aaron Fidoa and Mike Litzo have developed a, a condition index um, starting in 2019 and, and that condition index uh, indicated that in 2019, the body condition of crab was very poor compared to even just 2021 and 2022. Um, so putting all of these pieces of this puzzle together, um, the conclusion that we came to was that increased metabolic demands, changes in weight and size, and uh, decreased spatial extent suggests that starvation likely played a role in the collapse of snow crab. Um, one question I often get when I, I talk about this is what, what else was going on in the Bering Sea during this, this marine heat wave in 2018 and 2019 where the bottom temperatures were very high? And um, they're interesting things. Uh, tanner crab, for example, was uh, another a similar stock that generally stays out of the cold pool. Tanner crab look similar to, to snow crab and um, from Buck Stockhausen's assessment last year, the um, recruitment in 2023 and 2022 that was estimated was some of the highest on record. And when you lag that back to when it settled to the bottom of the ocean, that was during the heat wave. Um, the estimated walleye pollock recruitment in 2019 during that heat wave was also the highest on record currently. We've also seen a lot of sablefish uh, recruitment since really the blob uh, coming through the Gulf. Um, there are, are, are other stocks in the area that didn't do so well. There were the salmon in the Yukon that are in big trouble. There were um, marine mammal and bird die-offs as well. So. I guess the, the point that I wanted to make here is that um, while snow crab had and, and other species had very adverse reactions to the marine heat wave, it seems to have benefited some other species as well. Okay, so the next question on our list was what happens next? Um, and once you have a model that you can link uh, different population processes to environmental indices and environmental drivers, you can think about how those environmental drivers might change in the future, and that can tell you how you can might expect the population to behave under different scenarios. And so that's our, our next step here. Um, each of these black lines represent the estimated mortality here at top for immature animals, mature mortality here, um, estimated recruitment, which is just the small animals coming into the population, and then this is the, the probability of um, terminally molting here in the black. And 
you can explain each of these population processes in incorporating environmental indices like ice um, or the Arctic Oscillation and density um, better than if you didn't. And that's what those colored lines show. They show different combinations of density and environmental drivers to try and explain um, the variation in these processes. So once you've got these links, you can, oh, I'll talk a little bit about the links first. Um, so for ice in this analysis was a, a big player in both mortality and recruitment. So these blue lines here uh, indicate the relationship between the covariate at the top, ice here in the middle, and then whatever population process the color indicates. So for this, if there's very little ice, there's very little recruitment. If there's a lot of ice, there's a lot of recruitment. Um, so these correlative relationships can be used to project the, the populations forward. Same for um, mortality. If there's very little ice, the mortality is, is high. Um, I'm not going to go into the one down here deeply, but this is a, kind of a neat ecological story. Um, you can predict the, the probability of terminally molting, of maturing, by um, the number of small mature males out there and the number of large mature males out there. And the big story here is this dark blue over here that says if there are a lot of mature males out there and you're a medium-sized um, male, you're going to delay um, molting so to maturity so you can get bigger and compete with the larger males that are already out there. Okay, so if you've got these sorts of relationships, uh, you can then project the stock forward. And that's what I've done here. So each of the processes are on the outside, maturity at top right, recruits, uh, bottom right, natural mortality, bottom left. Um, and then the top left is the trajectory of the mature portion of the population. Um, the, the takeaway from this is that because of that strong relationship to ice, this is under a scenario where ice um, declines over the next 40 years. Because of the strong relationship of recruitment to ice, the recruits just gradually trend downward. And that filters through to the mature male biomass, uh, abundance actually. Um, there is a short window here, uh, no matter how you model it, uh, of the potential for a rebound if the uh, ice and Arctic oscillation line up, but there's also a lot of uncertainty around uh, whether or not that could happen. Um, let's see, so I think I wanted to say that um, this is a, a somewhat unusual example where you found we found this many relationships between population processes and um, environmental drivers. Uh, these sorts of relationships are prone to breaking down, so there's probably more uncertainty associated with these trajectories than are represented here. Uh, but these are the sorts of things that we're trying to create as scenario-based planning, so we can test different management strategies against these sorts of trajectories in the stock. And that leads to the next question, what do we do? Um, I wanted to start this part just by saying that um, fisheries management has been unreasonably effective over the last couple of decades of controlling uh, fishing mortality. And I, one of my um, favorite pa papers of the last several years is this paper by Ray Hilborn that looks at the RAM Legacy Stock Assessment Database. It's got almost 900 stocks from around the globe and this figure uh, shows the unreasonable efficacy of, of fisheries management globally. Um, this green line here is the exploitation rate relative to a target. So if that target, if the, the green line is above um, the gray line here, above one, that means that overfishing is occurring. And this bend in the 1990s is really when uh, fisheries management kicked in globally. And this, this boomerang of the exploitation rates is uh, a testament to the effort that has been put in around the globe by fishery scientists and government officials and managers and stakeholders to be invested in this process. Um, from these analyses, we also know that management targets and rebuilding plans, which are, are central pieces of 
our management in, in Alaska are one of the good predictors of um, good fisheries management. And that was by a paper by Mike Melnichuk that came out right after this analysis, but also based on the RAM legacy database. So in that context, um, wanting to say that fisheries management has, has done its a good job over the last several decades, um, I'm gonna throw a wrench into that process. And that wrench is climate change. One of the questions that we got, even though we know that our management targets are important to good management, was whether or not we should change those as we see the environment changing. And our national standards actually direct us to do this. Our, our targets are meant to reflect the current and projected environmental conditions. So to think through this a bit, I've got a, a toy example here of a stock. Um, and we're looking at it in biomass and harvest rate space. So biomass on the x-axis, harvest rate on the y. This gray line represents the stock, whoops, represents the stock. Um, when it's unfished, it sits at a thousand units of biomass. And as you increase the harvest rate, it declines. Um, this dashed line represents that sloped harvest control rule that we talked about earlier. That was one of the, the key pieces of, um, key tools in our fisheries management arsenal. And um, the point A here is our, our um, biomass at maximum sustainable yield. That's our, our target. And then beneath that target, our, our harvest rates will decline. So uh, fisheries manager runs into a situation where the environment changes and they have to make a decision on whether or not they should change their targets. It might look something like this. So if the carrying capacity drops to 500, that would imply uh, a decline in the um, target biomass. And then your harvest control rule shape would also look like this. What that means is that if the stock was at... Um, say 400 here, and you're using your old rule, your old target, you would keep your harvest rate high, um, or you would keep your, your harvest rate would come down to here, but if you use the, the new target, it would remain high. I'll try and explain that just a little bit better here. Um, you can run through the thought experiment of whether, what would happen if a manager changed their targets from A to B by projecting this forward under those different decisions and seeing what the biomass left in the ocean, the, the harvest that they get or the catch they get and the rates that they have to apply to the population uh, to get that harvest uh, it can tell us something about that decision. Um, first, if, if you change your targets to, to match the environmental conditions, um, your, the biomass in the water will be much lower than if it did. That's the top panel. The harvest you get is very similar. You get a little bit more if you change, but in the grand scheme, it's, they're relatively similar. But the harvest rates you apply if you change are much higher than they would be if you don't change. And I think that this thought exercise is uh, perhaps underappreciated. Um, and I'll repeat again that because I think it's a counterintuitive result that if we adjust our management targets to reflect decreased productivity, we're going to place higher exploitation rates on populations under stress. And I think that um, just from a a priori perspective is not what you would expect um, from uh, managers of, of natural resources. So that was a very simple model that I showed. I just want to say that we did it with a more complicated model, snow crab. If you look to the harvest rate here, you get the same sort of thing. The blue line is where you change. The green line is where you keep your historical targets. Um, under that, the yield is also very similar. Uh, if you'd like to read that paper, it's linked here somewhere. We also looked at changes in other processes than recruitment, like growth and M. And under our current system, um, and changing will exacerbate the problem that I just described as it not only moves this kink in the control rule um, at, to a lower biomass, but it increases the fishing mortalities. And the papers go into why all of that happens. I'm not going to talk about it right now. Okay, um, I'm getting close to time, so I'm going to try to summarize all of that and then leave you with a couple of closing thoughts. Um, the 
the effort that goes into managing crab populations in the Bering Sea is big. Uh, we've got huge survey teams. We have the council. We've got our plan teams. There are a lot of people working on these problems. And uh, even these intensely managed populations with great data can collapse. And I think that's a, a an important lesson to think about. Um, at the same time, these, these massive environmental change that we are seeing through the marine heat waves and the gradual trends in um, ice and temperature can have complex impacts. There, there are going to be winners and losers, like I showed you before. Snow crab had very negative uh, responses to the marine heat wave, but pollock and tanner crab seem to have uh, more positive responses. Um, when we try to incorporate the environmental change into our current models um, and our current management frameworks, this can have some counterintuitive outcomes. So this is a space that I think that uh, spending some time um, thinking as a larger entity throughout NOAA is going to be useful. And I, I do want to emphasize that fisheries management has been a great success over the last several decades at controlling exploitation rates in many parts of the world. But climate change is a, a novel issue that our current systems that think about the world in equilibrium are going to have a difficult time uh, facing. Um, so these are my closing thoughts. Uh, this should be quick. Um, I think it's been um, tricky thinking about uh, how what sorts of targets we should have for stocks that are changing through time. And I, I think I'm coming uh, to a more solid opinion that changing your reference points is not a great idea. Um, if you change your reference point, you'll just gradually chase your stock into the ground. And I, I don't feel like that's a, a great idea. Um, if I was coming at this a new and naive, I would think that we would want to fish the stocks that are going to flourish under uh, climate change harder and allow the species that are under stress time to adapt. Um, so thinking about ways to make that happen, I think is will be useful time spent. And one of the ways that we could help that process is looking for ways to relieve stress on the populations for which we actually have management levers. And by that, I mean, when uh, we came to the result that we thought that the driver of the snow crab collapse was a marine heat wave, it was nice to have an answer, but it was also hard because it was an answer that we didn't have a, a lever for in management. We couldn't push a button and get more ice on the Bering Sea. So it was um, somewhat frustrating. And I guess, Ultimately, even if I have this model that I just shared that links all of these processes to environmental um, drivers and density dependence, and I can project it forward and get some prediction for what the future is going to be, even if that was a, a perfect predictor of the future, if I have no lever to change that future, um, I'm left wondering what to do. Um, and I think, so part of this is, Part of trying to look for management levers um, needs to be built around explicitly identifying trade-offs. And the trade-offs that I'm uh, particularly speaking about are things like um, the efficacy of protected areas or the gear restrictions that we have, or focused research on bycatch effects. Um, one of the big things that's talked about in crab world a lot is how um, the other fisheries for things like pollock or cod are affecting the, um, the crab stocks. And um, while we have observations of bycatch that comes up in the nets over time, we there's also likely unobserved bycatch. So the net goes along the bottom and bonks the crab on the head, but it doesn't go in the net and that crab is no longer. So um, I think focusing our, um, or at least a portion of our research around trying to understand these other potential effects would be useful. And finally, um, 
I think the thing that has come out of this whole um, ordeal is the, the need for flexibility in the fishing communities. Uh, one of the hardest things to watch throughout this process has been um, the, well, the, the, the crabbers not having any crab to fish. Um, and part of this is that their, um, the quota system has set it up, has been set up in a way that it's difficult, it can be difficult to change fisheries. And these crabbers are mostly invested in the crab fisheries. So when the crab go away, they can't fish the other things that may or may not be flourishing. Um, in the system. So thinking about ways to, to equitably um, manage the, the resources that flourish and flounder is going to be a, uh, a useful and fruitful topic of, of research going forward. I think um, given that we're about 10 minutes out, I'm going to stop there and just say thanks to a lot of people in the, in the ocean there. There are many I, I missed, I'm sure. This is a picture in Duck Harbor um, I took before going out on the survey. Um, if you haven't done anything like that and you have interest in doing something like that, you should reach out to, to somebody that can get you out there because it's a, a great experience and it's collecting vital data for these sorts of analyses. So thank you all for listening. And if you have questions afterwards that you don't wanna uh, chat, uh, you can reach me at this email address. All right. Cody, thank you so much. This was a fantastic presentation. I Thanks. am going to move us on to our Q&A section. The first question we have here says, if recruitment is impacted by changes in the ice, it seems that the population growth rate would decline and harvest rate should decrease. Yeah, that is right. And I think that was one of the um, central messages of the paper that I uh, attempted to describe in where we should set our management targets. If we think that um, changing our management targets to reflect the, the new conditions of no ice um, is the route to go, this would be this wouldn't happen. The, the harvest rates would be higher than if we didn't. So um, I think keeping in, in mind these sorts of a priori um, expectations about what management should be doing is a good, a good thing to do as we think through how to face these problems. Great, thank you. All right, then we have one more question here. And this question says, what is the difference in negative impacts between surveys and trawl fishing? Is that measured? Ooh, that's a good a good question. Um, I guess the the spatial footprint of a trawl survey is um, vastly smaller than the spatial footprint of uh, the trawl fleets. Um, for for snow crab. There's actually been some interesting studies done recently on essential fish habitat and what do they call it? The, um, the fishing impact, shoot, I'm forgetting the acronym, but basically they've created maps that look at how much of the seafloor is impacted by different sorts of fishing uh, methodology. And um, if you're interested in those, you can go to one of the rebuilding plans for snow crab. There are some neat maps in there that, that quantify that. Um, but on, let's see, the the spatial footprint of the um, of the trawl survey, we go out at 435 locations in tow for half an hour um, with a net that is what maybe a hundred yards across. So that is uh, relatively small, but um, from these um, samples, given the number of them, we've got over 400 of them, we can build a, a relatively good index of abundance for a large number of species. So if you want to see the, um, the impact of different uh, fishing gears, you should uh, hunt down the rebuilding um, the rebuilding plan for snow crab, and that will give you an entry to the different sorts of maps that we've got um, for the impacts of different fisheries on different species. 
Great, thank you so much. All right, we have a bunch of questions coming in, so we're gonna try to get through them um, as quickly as we can. And just a reminder, if you do have any questions, to make sure to put those in the Q&A panel that's on the right side of your screen. Um, all right, next question, Cody, that we have says, there's a lot of backlash right now regarding trawl fishing and bycatch. Are there any plans of closing crab areas to midwater trawls as well as they often fish bottom? You are right. This is a very contentious topic right now, and there's a lot of council effort spent um, looking at different plans. Um, as far as I know right now, there is there are no plans to do this, um, but it's something that is talked about and plans are being put forward to be considered at least. Um, each year, if you're interested in hearing more about this, I would go to the North Pacific Fisheries Marine Management Council website, npfmc.org, and they've got um, documents that include the discussion of the council and how things were uh, left recently. That's a great, a great resource to pursue this further. Great, thank you. All right, next question says, do salmon, for example, Bristol Bay sockeye, have any ecological interaction with snow crab? Oh, this is a fun one. Um, and I wish Aaron was here to talk a bit more about it. Um, there, so the salmon likely um, eat the, the larvae of crab as they're in their pelagic phase. So crab, um, I showed you the picture of the male and the female in the, the the mating embrace at some point in time after that happens um, larvae are released into the water column they float for a few months and then they settle back onto the seafloor um, so during that time we know that salmon will sometimes eat the uh, the larvae i think it's important to to note that um, the mortality of event that we saw here would not be related to that at all because we were observing crab that were um, 55 millimeters carapace width on, on the seafloor that had been growing for five years that salmon would not interact with at all. Um, but this is, we, I think there is, we have um, ecosystem, let's see, ESPs and ESRs, ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles that try to link and list all of the things that we think may be interrelated to crab dynamics and um, salmon are one of the things when listed when we're thinking about the larval dynamics. All right, thank you. The next question says, what do you do with the catch from a survey? Uh, most of it goes back into the ocean. Um, some of it goes back uh, alive and some of it we need to take things like otoliths or stomach samples um, or the process of sexing them can be invasive sometimes so that, that goes back into the ocean to uh, feed other things on, on the seafloor. Perfect. Oh, and so, some of it, I should also say that some of it comes home to our laboratories too. So um, when I was out there, we were collecting um, small snow crab to bring back into the lab to run um, long-term experiments on to try and understand how things like ocean acidification or warming temperatures can impact their ability to um, form shells or to um, grow in general. So. Um, some of it does come back to the lab as well. Great, thank you so much, Cody. We only have a few more minutes um, and we do have some questions coming in. So let me get this one up here. This says, and given such a huge pulse in a natural mortality event, what would that imply about how long-term natural mortality should be applied for reference points? Oh, gosh, this is a very hard question. And if this is a gym, I think it is. Uh, I'll come find you later and <laughs> thank you for such a hard question. Um, but the, so natural mortality is a, a key parameter in our models. It, it really influences 
uh, the dynamics of the population and what our reference points look like. Um, I think one of the things that I've really struggled with trying to think both about how to model population dynamics and what our targets should be is that historically we were in a framework where we could use the past to try and understand what the future should be like. And that sort of equilibrium system was very convenient for these sorts of calculations. And moving to a, a scenario in which we, the future is, will not be similar to the past makes things so much harder. Um, I, I think, I guess we're, we're kind of pursuing two different options here. One is to try and um, include uh, covariates into our, our projections to understand the potential range of what those targets could be. Um, and the other is to not even think about that and try to maintain our status quo targets and um, which are often more conservative than they would be if you tried to incorporate that sort of mortality event or the, an increased likelihood of those sorts of mortality events into the future. So I, honestly, it's a hard question that I don't have a great answer for right now. And I'm hoping that all of the, the big brains out there are going to help us think through this question going forward.